with those things in mind, let's, uh, let's begin with a prayer, and uh, then we'll get into our material. So let's bow and pray. Father, I want to thank you, first of all, for just the opportunity here in the middle of the week uh, to recharge. Uh, sometimes uh, we understand this with our cell phones that um, when it gets down to a certain point, it seems to drain out quickly. And sometimes that's the way faith feels. That's the way uh, uh, our walk with you can feel at times. So I pray, Father, that we will be energized tonight by our time together. I pray that our time together will help deepen uh, relationships in particular, uh, deepen marital intimacy. And I pray, Father, for you to use Laurie and I as tools to be a source of help and uh, blessing. Father, thank you for uh, blessing Jimmy and Bambi and Jimmy to get out of, of the hospital. I pray that you will be with June and with Angela and with Brenda and Kathy and Rex, all as they deal with um, the, the uh, bouts that they're having. Several of them are dealing with cancer or surgeries coming up. So not only Father help them physically, but help them uh, with a peace of mind and a peace of heart, knowing that you, their good Father, is overseeing everything. Father, um, we love you. We uh, continue to be amazed at how gracious and wonderful you are. And I pray, Father, that you see the humility and gratitude in our lives uh, that comes from our appreciation for your goodness and grace. Father, bless this class tonight, and uh, may we all grow from it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let me let a few more people in here. I want to welcome all of you who are joining um, and glad that you are here. As we begin this, I, I should probably say to uh, all of you who have uh, joined tonight that you are the courageous ones. Uh, I remember when I taught this um, class probably 17 years ago, uh, it, it was a pretty full class, but it was made up of a lot of uh, uh, newly married people, and, uh, and it was a um, very uh, interesting class, but some people are frightened by the Song of Solomon. And uh, they shy away from it, knowing the uh, content of the book. I, I'm, I am almost positive that there are some people who shy away from the class like this because, because they're afraid of what others might think of them for, uh, uh, for joining a class like this. But, so I, I applaud you for being courageous and for wanting to delve into something that I think uh, is is powerful and meaningful. So let me give you the introduction to the introduction. And I, I saw the need for this as Laurie and I were talking about the class and, and what role she would play and, and different things. And from her questions, I um, realized that I probably needed to give some introduction to the introduction. So that's what this is. Now, to begin with, statistics and anecdotal evidence suggest that COVID-19 has had an adverse effect on marriages and families. Uh, there has just been a lot of stress. There's been a lot of strain. Uh, people have experienced uh, financial stress and parental stress and social stress. Many parents have been put in positions that they, um, as teachers and as uh, spending all their time with their children, that, that's been very difficult. And so those relationships, some of those relationships have been hurt and are presently hurting. So 
I think particularly those who are dealing with empty nest have had that accentuated during this time. So I want to say, if you know somebody who uh, is experiencing some of those um, stresses and difficulties as a result of COVID on their uh, relationship, know that help is available. Now, this study is both a challenging, challenging study and an exciting study. It is challenging because there are so many misconceptions about the matter of marital intimacy. It is an exciting matter because when you do things God's way, it's wonderful. It's always his design for things to be wonderful when you do it his way. Now, this is kind of what came out in uh, when Laurie and I were talking about it uh, the other night. The traditional view of the Song of Songs is that it was written by Solomon as part of the wisdom literature to describe his sexual intimacy with his beloved. And many of you have probably read, read it that way and understood it that way. There are just a few problems with that. And so let me highlight them. Number one, that doesn't fit the description of Solomon uh, from scripture or from secular writings. Uh, Solomon had many women. There was not what we would consider, and as we will see in the, um, in the study, there was not a single beloved who uh, Solomon was devoted to. Secondly, what makes the song so powerful is that it contrasts um, the power and possessiveness that we often see in, in sexual matters. And when we talk about that, we, we see this particularly illustrated in the life of Solomon, where the power and possessiveness that he had as king over women, in fact, hundreds, even uh, a thousand women, we know that that is a powerful thing that is contrasted, you know, wh whether we're talking about the, the uh, power and possess possessiveness of uh, sexual matters of a husband forcing himself without tenderness or a wife using sex as a tool to manipulate. We see that contrasted against an open, true, beautiful, uninhibited emotional and physical intimacy. And I think ultimately that's what the Song of Solomon, our Song of Songs, is all about. Contrasting those two views that we really continue to see in our world today, uh, manifested in, in, in various ways that we will talk about. And then thirdly, in the song, Solomon is not described in very flattering ways. And so it's doubtful that he would write that about himself unless he wrote it in retrospect about his failings, which is possible. Uh, perhaps it is more likely that another author wrote this and dedicated it to Solomon to show the contrast, contrast between those two loves, the so-called love of power and possessiveness versus a, a deep intimacy and true relationship where there is a singular uh, object of affection. So even though it's not the traditional presentation or interpretation of the song, I am choosing to teach this as the contrast between how Solomon treated women and this special relationship that is set against it. But I think either way that you read the, the song, the ultimate points about marital intimacy come out, which I think is the uh, 
key and point of the song. So that is the introduction to the introduction. Does anybody have a question about that? Now, I should say right now up front, um, there are no dumb questions and there are no questions, I was gonna say that I will, I, I will laugh at. I, I can't promise that, can't promise that. I might laugh, but it will not be uh, in a, a shameful, humiliating way. It, you just might have something that, that, that makes me laugh when you ask it. This is, this is often an awkward topic. You know, I've, I've been to several marital retreats. I'll talk about this in just a moment. Um, and this is difficult, even when you segregate men and women, this is difficult even in those settings for people to talk openly about. And so I don't want you to be inhibited uh, by the questions that you may have. Uh, in fact, at, I think it was about the third, um, about the third marriage retreat, Laurie had the privilege of introducing me when I spoke on the subject of sexual intimacy and tell them how you uh, introduced me at the, um, at the retreat. Well, I knew, he, I knew what topic he was going to be talking about. So I introduced him as Dr. Love. <laughs> So you all are listening to Dr. Love tonight. I just want you all to get that, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, I have to laugh because I'm not sure how applicable that is. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a numbskull trying to figure this, you know, all, all the things of life out. But uh, I will share with you the, um, the things that I know and, and have, have learned over the years. And I want to start, when we move into scripture, we're moving now into question number one. I want us to read together 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. And um, Laurie, would you go ahead and read that for us? Others, you be ready uh, with some other passages we'll be reading, but I'm going to have Laurie read this first one. Second Peter 1 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Okay. I love that passage because it talks about God's generosity in giving us not some things, not most things, but everything that we need for life and godliness. So here's, here's the um, question. Written roughly 3,000 years ago, the Song of Songs, or the greatest song, still speaks powerful lessons into our personal and private intimacy. It is a love song that contrasts a worldly approach to intimacy with a godly approach to intimacy. All right, so I'm looking for your input here. Where are people learning about love, romance, and sex today, and what are they learning? Jump in. I would say uh, mostly from their peers or um, from TV shows or movies. They're learning that it's okay to be free with okay. with with sex. Yeah, and and. You know, uh, Josh, you're not far removed um, from you know the teenagehood. What do you? What do you? What's that? How's that impacting people to have that kind of exposure and to have that talk to them? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think what with what I've seen is it. It's you know people are getting hurt more often. Um, you know, they're just they. they very emotional and uh, I guess heartbreak, if that's what you want to call it, is uh, too often, it's too frequent, and it just leads to disaster. Good. Thank you for, for giving that input. Others? 
Um, where are people learning about love, romance, and sex today, and what are they learning? Now, I hope that none of you are sitting there and saying, as I'm talking about sex and romance, and you're beginning to sing the song in the back of your mind, precious memories. Now, I hope that's not happening, but you know, so I'm 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 urging you to come out. It it seems like oh, uh, a lot of individuals, well, I guess forever have learned from experience. And sometimes that's not necessarily the right way to learn, but uh, experimenting or curiosity, uh, just not knowing what it is always and wanting to find out. Uh, it's kind of, I looked, you know, I was looking up in the dictionary when I was little, kind of things about it out of curiosity. And that was kind of the very first the, uh, area that I uh, learned about it from. So. All right, so you looked in the dictionary, um, and, and, and so that's one avenue that people may uh, turn to. What, what other things, and what are people learning? I think a lot of, probably even teenagers and young adults learn from watching TV and movies, and they're learning that it's permissible, that it's okay to hook up and to try each other out and do whatever and even after the court ruling a few years ago with the same-sex marriages I've noticed in TV shows and movies now it's more prevalent that you're seeing the same sex genders hooking up together but it's all just natural and it's okay it's what we do mm. and I'm afraid that's what kids today are learning so one of the things that seems to be is the sacredness of, of the sexual relationship um, has been lost um, I, I want to make this clear in the beginning. Disciples of Jesus, and this is not just about, just about intimacy. This is about everything. Disciples of Jesus are to learn from our Lord Jesus Christ about all matters. We were meant to learn from godly parents who speak openly and honestly and beautifully of God's gift and from the church. However, the only message that many hear from parents and church is, don't, that's bad. And I think that's unfortunate. And I think that that has, that has harmed um, people as much as some of the um, permissiveness has hurt. And so uh, speaking as someone who... Uh, who, who my brothers who are eight and 11 years older than me, when I turned about 11 years old, my brothers came to me and said, hey, have mom and dad had to talk with you yet? And of course, my face turned red and I didn't know what to think or what to say. And, and, they, and I said, well, what, 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 what kind of talk are you talking about? And they said, well, the talk, the sex talk. And I said, no, I don't, they, they didn't. And so it made me very uncomfortable Apparently, my parents had had a sex talk with them. But somewhere in the eight-year gap between my younger older brother and me, I guess they chose not to. And so, um, unfortunately, that describes most homes. I remember teaching at LCU. And out of a class of, I think, 30 students, I said, how many of you have had your parents talk to you? about sexual intimacy and uh, I think three raised their hands. So, so that, that by, uh, by nature of the void created causes people as Josh talked about to learn from their friends or the internet or the locker room or movies. And what they're hearing is that it's the greatest thing there is, but it's no big deal which is a really has to be a confusing message. And that you don't want to be a loser and miss out, you know, the FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, that you have to know how to perform. There are all kinds of 
misconceptions, I think, that people are learning that actually, uh, as Josh talked about, can be uh, disastrous uh, to a good understanding, a healthy understanding about God's plan of marital intimacy. So let's talk about God's plan. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And somebody read 23 through 25, please. The man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they should become one flesh. Through 25. Oh, okay. Um, and the man and his wife were both naked, were not ashamed. Okay. By virtue of you being in this class, I am going to make the assumption that you understand this very well. Uh, and then that is that God created sex as a beautiful, pleasurable, fun, playful wedding gift. That's what God intended for it to be. It is sacred in the sense that it is set apart uh, between a husband and wife. And it connects that husband and wife in ways that nothing else can. So why, maybe especially among Christians, are there such unhealthy views and awkward discussions about sex? Why do you think that is? Why are there so many unhealthy views, even among Christians, and uh, awkward discussions about sex? Dale, a lot of it to me is they don't realize this is a gift from God. This is something very precious that we need to understand that. That's okay, so some people don't recognize it, that they, they see it uh, maybe as a creation by Hugh Hefner uh, somewhere along the way instead of this beautiful gift from God, okay? Some people may feel ashamed just depending on how they were raised. Yep. They're not open to it as we should through God, but we, what we've been through, through life. Yeah. Where, Some people have uh, experiences, shameful experiences, experiences that they regret, that they feel guilty about. In some homes, people grew up in settings where sex was viewed as a shameful thing. Um, and so it's awkward to talk openly about it because there's so much shame attached to it. Other ideas? I think the fact that um, it is so sacred and it's between those two people and, um, you know, that holy bond just between the man and the woman um, in some ways makes it seem like it's taboo or like it's um an impenetrable topic mm. um, not, you know the bond itself is impenetrable but the topic shouldn't but it kind of feels that way just because um you know up until the point that you experience it it's like um something feels like it's off limits mm. because yeah. we don't know that it's holy and and we don't understand fully um mm. Yeah, and, and I, I think the, the downside of that is that many are unprepared uh, to enjoy it 
to the extent that God intended. Uh, because they're still trying to, I mean, uh, I mean, I've talked to people with people who've been married for decades and they're still trying to figure this thing out a little bit. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't uh, say that uh, Laurie and I are still learning things uh, about it. I certainly um, hope that I'm, I'm more knowledgeable and it's not because of, of experience so much as it is I've, I've read and you know, as part of being a counselor, I've, I've, I've done study uh, into this area. But for many people, sex is not the joy it was meant to be. It's not the binding agent that it was meant to be. In large, large part, it's because couples have not had a chance to learn uh, the way that they need to learn. I, I spoke about intimacy at the very first marriage retreat. And I spoke at that, uh, on that topic, not because I was an expert, but because no one was, else was willing to do it. And the reason no one was willing to do it is because of the, some of the things we're talking about. Uh, there's so much misinformation. And so some marriages struggle with this part of their relationship so they don't know what to say some feel guilty some are afraid of the power of sex some are afraid that if they mention it their kids will go out and do it um, some of us are just not equipped to talk about it i remember um, a preaching when i was in west virginia so i was probably in my late 20s at the time i was preaching about um, sex and intimacy uh, on a Sunday night and a, uh, and a family got up and left. And this was a small church anyway, so you, can't, you couldn't miss them getting up and leaving. And um, the uh, father called me the next day and chastised me for preaching so openly about that. And, and I respected his um, feelings about that and said, you know, I'm, I'm not holding anything against you because you left. Those are decisions you had, have to make as a dad. But I defended my decision to talk openly about it. Well, as his children grew, guess what happened? He came back and said, I was right. Because he knew that that topic needed to be discussed in a godly, holy way. And if church didn't do it and parents didn't do it, kids weren't gonna get the kind of information that they needed. So let's jump um, first back a few verses and then we're gonna jump up a few verses. Somebody read Genesis 2, 16 through uh, 17 and then Genesis 3, 1 through 8. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay. We love surely die, don't we? We all love surely die. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's a woman at Greenlawn named Shirley Die. So um, anyway. Poor, poor effort at humor, so I appreciate those, those of you who are smiling anyway. Um, this is God's one command. Don't eat from the one tree. Got all kinds of other things around, all kinds of delights, everything that you can imagine um, that would be uh, pleasing and tasty, and you've got one tree. All right, we jump ahead to chapter 3, 1 through 8. Mike, read that for us. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food 
and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. All right. You may say, well, what, why are we reading these passages? I think these passages are the key passages to help us understand why this sacred gift is in such a confused state. This passage is crucial to sex and every other topic that matters to human beings. And it's crucial because it tells us something about God. All right? Um, I think for some people, connecting sex and God sounds uh, sacrilegious. But that shows how far away we have gotten from the, the design that God had in mind. So how does the evil one paint God, and what does that have to do with sex? Jump on the first part of the question. Was the evil one, how does the evil one paint God? He wants us to think that um, God is uh, someone who keeps things from us and um, is someone who doesn't want us to experience full joy. So he holds things, the best fruits, you know, the best parts of, of knowledge um, of mm -hmm. things in life from us um, because those are set apart for him to experience and not for us. Very good. God is just up there trying to think of ways to steal our fun. That's the way the evil one paints God. What else do you see about how the evil one painted God? Accuses God of being a liar because God said, you'll surely die if you do this. And of course, we understand what that means, but after they took of the fruit, they didn't die. But there was that shame and anger and all those feelings that come with sin. So the, the, the evil one paints God as being not trustworthy. He, he, he's lying about this. Trin, it looked like you were about to say something. Were you wanting to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that I, th I think often Satan makes us to believe that, that God is forgiving and, and thinking into that, talking about the lies, but uh, that, you know, if we are to move in a direction that we don't necessarily think is good, that uh, he will forgive us. All right, so, we, so I get... Uh, excused um, in anticipation of what I'm about to do. To, to, to break his command, well, God will be, will forgive. You know, and, and, and people have been so bold as to say that, you know. Yeah, I know this is wrong, but God will forgive. So what does all that have to do with, with uh, sex? How does Satan's portrait of God how, what does that have to do with sex? How does that affect the whole topic? I'm glad you asked. Um, the evil one painted God as the one who steals your fun and consciously or unconsciously, the church has often done the same thing. 
especially when it comes to sex. When reality is God gives freedom and joy. There, some of the advice that uh, has been given through the years is, is comical looking at it now, but it's not comical when you think about how people have been hurt by it. Uh, some of you may be aware of this, but some of the advice given to an unwilling wife, uh, a wife who was will, unwilling to be a, a, a sexual partner to her husband, um, women were told, close your eyes and think of England. Okay, if you don't believe that, look it up, all right? Google it. Uh, that's what some unwilling wives were told. Close your eyes and think of England. In other words, I know you're not going to enjoy it. It's not for you, it's not for you as a woman to enjoy it. This is just something that we have to do for men. What a terrible, terrible, unfortunate message that's been sent there. Um, Everything God designed is good. But what has happened is that God's boundaries of protection and joy have been twisted to make it look like God is the villain. That's what Satan did so masterfully. That's what Mike was talking about a few minutes ago when it said, when he talked about Satan presenting God as a liar. God's not trustworthy, so you can't trust God's ways when it comes to sex. That's the implication. That's why Genesis 3 is such a powerful part of this discussion, because how you view God and whether he is trustworthy will have implications for how, what you do with the whole matter of sexuality. So we must learn where the messages come from and, and trace if they're traced back to the liar, we need to discard them. And if they're traced back to God, we need to embrace them. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping that we can do through, um, through the study of the Song of Songs. So turn to Ephesians 5. Turn to Ephesians 5. Okay, we'll have other opportunities. Uh, Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. Somebody jump in and read that, please. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do the, to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, the husband, is the body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are the members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. I am talking about Christ and the church, how each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, interesting. Paul uh, calls the oneness of a husband and wife a mystery. Now, we get this idea of oneness from Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 24, that we read a few minutes ago. Uh, Paul says it's a mystery what we're talking about. Uh, it's, it was interesting a couple of days ago that I was talking with my five-year-old granddaughter, Olivia, and I was talking about when a, 
when a man and a woman become husband and wife and they're married, they become one. And she just let out this huge laughter. And she said, how can, a, how can two people become one person? That seemed absurd to her. So here's the question. What does it mean for a husband and wife to become one? What does that mean? There are several of you here who went through premarital counseling with me and should know the answer to this question. Um, so not to put any pressure on the at least three couples here who have done that, but. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is um, a oneness, not just in body, but in mind and spirit. So um, things like trusting and, um, you know, communication and seeking to understand one another, um, that type of oneness. And then that, of course, is um, ultimately, you know, consummated or comes together in the sexual intimacy. And it's like a cycle, you know, one affects the other. Um, the closer you are in spirit and mind, the better um, physical relationship there will be and vice versa. Trent, give that woman a kiss. She gets a star today. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that they become the same person. Uh, I told her that, that they become unified in heart and mind and soul and body, just as uh, Andrea was saying. It, it, this oneness really kind of ha boils down to two aspects uh, in its nature. One is the selflessness. I no longer can just think about me. I have to think about the other. In fact, I think about the other first instead of me. And the other is the, uh, the sexual nature. I now give myself to satisfy and pleasure my spouse. And through that, we not only experience play, we may also create new life. Now that has spiritual implications as well as um, physical implications. Life comes from the oneness of the husband and a wife. That is the mystery. And it's life on many levels that takes place. Uh, when a husband and wife experience this oneness. You know, the obvious one is the creation of a, of a child, um, but there is, there is life on so many other levels as well, which has implications for our oneness with God and what that means. Remember, um, especially as we've highlighted in the gospel, in the study of the gospel of John, so many times Jesus prayed, Father, this is John 17, Father, make them one as we are one and them to be one with us. Wait a minute, he's using the same language as Paul is using here about a husband and wife's marriage relationship. Well, that's pretty significant. He's telling us, Marriage is meant to tell us something about our relationship with God. And so it, it, it's probably pretty important for us to understand that better. Comments, questions, before we go on to the next question. I must be doing a brilliant job. <laughs> Hey Dale, yep. uh, to me, I mean, the more, <clears throat> the more I find satisfaction with the Lord, the more uh, being with my wife. I mean, it just we become a, we, our marriage has gotten just better and better. I mean, she's my best friend. She's my buddy. She's you know, um, <clears throat> like you said, you know, she comes first. You know, my thoughts. You know, I think about her first, and and uh, 
and just makes life a lot easier too <laughs> to uh to just build a, a you know you know we're going on 31 years and and i mean it's 31 years is a lot better than five years let me tell you yeah yeah and, uh, just you know just just building on with each other is just you know sometimes we <clears throat> she'll answer my my sentence before i get there you know i mean she's already answering me you know so <laughs> But it's a it's a it's a good feeling. What you're describing, Henry, is what what God intended to happen. But it doesn't happen if we follow the world's way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And but when we follow God's design, that's the way it works. Listen, when I got married, I was 23 years old, and probably at the height of my um, or or in into the height of my uh, hormonal testosterone filled self okay and and I enjoyed uh, our sexual relationship then but I enjoy it much more now and I think that's what God intended to happen through doing things God's way all right any other questions or comments All right, the Song of Songs has been controversial for as long as we know. Uh, the commentators I have read said that there's, there's no point at which it wasn't controversial. There have been debates as to whether it should be interpreted literally as an erotic love song, which is how we are going to interpret it, or whether it should be uh, interpreted metaphorically as symbolizing the love of God for his people. Uh, let me just say as a parenthesis here, uh, there are some of the, there's some of the symbolism at, in, in the Song of Songs that you're really hard pressed to make it about God's love for his people, okay? Uh, you really kind of have to twist it to, to make it fit that. And, and so I think that that's a pretty clear indication that it, it's more than that. For a time, young Jewish men were not allowed to read it until they turned 30 years old. Some even thought that the Song of Songs should be excluded from the Old Testament canon. Uh, if you have read it uh, and certainly have read ahead, what makes this book so controversial? Okay, your assignment by next week is that you have read the book, all right? Uh, what is it that makes this so controversial, just based upon what we've talked about tonight? I think, um, you know, because a lot of people think that Solomon wrote it, um, and he's, you know, he had many concubines and wives and um, wasn't necessarily someone who was upheld as... Um, one who treated women, you know, with respect and um, that sacred relationship that we talked about. Um, it kind of, I guess, some people might think that it um, was written just as, um, I don't know, that maybe it shouldn't be read because he's just um, boasting maybe about his uh, experiences, you know, rather than, um, what it truly is uh, talking about, you know, the Shulamite, her beloved, and um, kind of contrasting that to the way that, um, you know, Solomon might have approached her versus the way the shepherd approached her, mm. um, kind of teaching us really what it means to um, have a, a <laughs> sexuality that's um, grounded in uh, trust and you know, that bond that's really special. Some people, I think, probably are concerned that it's more just about the passion and, and not as much about an opportunity to learn about um, relationship with a person to, um, you know, with another person that will ultimately lead us to God, which is why we would want something to be in the Bible, because it would bring us closer to him. Very good, very good. Uh, walk with, the, with me through this logic. 
Uh, who created sex? God. God. Thank you, Laurie. All right. God created sex. If God created, is it good or bad? Good. Good. It is good. So, if it is a good thing, why would we be afraid of it? Why would we be afraid to discuss it if it is a gift from him to bless marriages and relations, though that, that special marriage relationship and bond uh, couple together? You see, part of the concern... Um, is that it's it's pretty graphic, and we're going to be talking about it. It's pretty graphic in nature, um, and some even considered it obscene. It is so graphic in nature, but I think that reveals how distorted our view of sex is. It doesn't reflect on it doesn't reflect poorly on God. It reflects on how we have kind of developed this distorted view of sex. Desire is normal and good and sensual and here's here's what's hard for a lot of um i think maybe particularly young uh brides young brides who uh, have been told all their lives don't do it it's it's bad don't do it you're a bad girl if, if you do it um how do you flip that switch on your wedding night you know, going from it's bad and evil to all of a sudden, I'm supposed to indulge all of a sudden. Well, I, I think that couples who are given that message, it's it's very confusing and makes the, the, the sexual bond very hard and unnatural for them because it does seem so shame-filled, so attached to uh, to shameful thoughts and and shameful feelings and and I hope if you don't get anything else out of this um, quarter of classes that you will come away with a very positive view of sexuality um, certainly within the confines and boundaries that God has ordained but that it is this wonderful glorious thing that we're supposed to to be enjoying to the fullest and without inhibition about it. But for many, that's, that's, um, that's a hard thing. It's a hard thing because of various reasons we've talked about. All right, uh, before we run out of time, we need to deal with this because it pr prepares us for the rest of the book. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 11. You'll see a little bit of what I was talking about in the introduction to the introduction about how this really doesn't fit Solomon and a special woman, wife in his life, uh, the beloved. Uh, somebody read 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sid sorry, I don't know how to read, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon had fat, held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. And if you read uh, some of the following passages, you will see the extent to which his wives led him astray, which is that Solomon would even build temples uh, to his wives' gods and temples that even include, included child sacrifice. And this was a guy who built the temple of, of Yahweh. And he was building these um, temples for his wives. And his wives, his wives led him into worship of those um, idols. Based on the number of wives and concubines that Solomon had, what can you say about Solomon's view of women? 
What would you say about Solomon's view of women? He might have believed that they were some sort of tool or he had no respect for them. Very good. Um, they're, they're here for me to be, to, they're here for me to use. Okay. Which is pretty impersonal. I mean, you, you, a person becomes an object instead of a, a human being. What else do you think? Dale. Yeah. My thought is too, Solomon, he, he really didn't understand what God wanted the relationship of man and woman to be. And it's like, he just had all he wants, but that's not, that's not the direction that God gives us. Yeah. He owns the harem. And I emphasize the word owns. All right. They are a possession for him. Um, wives, how would you look, like to be viewed simply as a possession to your husband? Steve, I think I should get Linda's input on this. Don't you think? <laughs> what? You're, you're muted. She said... What'd you say, Linda? I might say something I shouldn't. <laughs> she said she might say something she shouldn't. <laughs> so, so the idea of being your husband's possession uh, probably doesn't uh, appeal to many of you. Am I, am, I, am I correct in that? Okay. I'm trying to keep Laurie from saying something she shouldn't, too. So uh, that's good. Um. That is what we see in Solomon, this power that he had over his harem because he was king, this possessiveness as he owned them to be uh, for his use, as Josh talked about. We have that contrasted against what we will see in other aspects of the Song of, of Songs, that there's this intimate connection between beloved and lover, as the King, as the uh, New International Version has it. So that's not what Solomon had. And we're going to see, I think, more of what God designed in, in um, contrast to what Solomon had. So sex is, is, is teaching us again about something about our relationship with God. It's pointing to the oneness with him. Our ultimate longing. Because even with the satisfaction and enjoyment and fulfillment that comes with sex, it's still pointing us to something that's missing. And that's relationship with God, if it's missing. It's not that sex is the ultimate experience. Sex is the ultimate pointer to the ultimate experience. And so that is what we hope to see and uncover in a beautiful way as we look at the Song of Songs. Who has a question or comment? Nobody? Dale, All right. Yeah. Uh, two things. One is just, it appears that sex has been exploited throughout ages. From, from biblical times down through now, it, it just seems like it's getting worse and worse and worse. And that exploitation has ruined many, many lives along the way. It's destroyed... Uh, young men and young women both. So I think, uh, I think from my perspective is, is, as I look at this, having raised three daughters, it, it's, I wish, 
I had done a better job of of talking about the intimate relationship with with that male. Partner. I think I think it's a topic that's long overdue, so I appreciate it. And the second thing is next Sunday when you preach, I'm going to be looking at Doctor Love up there. Okay. <laughs> I may even put on a, like a hat or something <laughs> with uh, or, uh, sure. Yeah, sure, open it up. Dr. Love. Dr. Love on it. Dr. Lovedale. <laughs> well, and, and, and you know what the reaction will be? The same as it is right now. Everybody will laugh at it. <laughs> so, so they know better. <laughs> we love you, Dr. Love. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. We got off to a great start tonight, and I um, appreciate you being here, and hope that you will be blessed throughout the quarter, and um, so uh, take care of yourselves, and we will look forward to seeing you Sunday.